you can't look at it in a vacuum and just say we're American just looking slaves at didn't have the same suicide rate. They didn't have the same kind of uh, abuse from within their family. All right, I am, uh, I'm glad to have our next guest on uh, the program. You can follow uh, on Twitter at Julie Ray. Now, uh, Julie Ray Goldstein is actually a no known actress, verified blue check mark on the Twitter, as long as they're still giving those out and allowing people to keep those right now, <laughs> and uh, has made it a point to uh, obviously criticize, go after this program quite a bit on Twitter, and we've been sort of missing each other. But you're on the show now, Julie Ray Goldstein. Thanks for being here. Oh, thanks for having me, Stephen. I actually really appreciate that you're willing to have a conversation. Really? You, you sound surprised. Uh, no, I'm not surprised. I think at, in this current political um, environment, I think people are too polarized in one way or another. And I, I like actually reaching out and looking at other points of view. So I'm, I'm kind of used to people being a little more combative. Sure. So. <laughs> okay, well, like, so, sometimes you can, you can come across c coming, coming a little hot on Twitter. So maybe that's why they might seem combative. Uh, combative. But listen, I, I, I appreciate it. And um, let me ask you this, I guess, before we kind of continue with the conversation. What, what is it that you think would be fruitful? What are you hoping to glean kind of from us sitting down here? Oh, absolutely. I think the thing that uh, interests me the most is making sure that your audience is aware of the actual science behind some of the things that you've said in the past. Sure. Um, I think we both come to it from a scientific perspective. We both want the best for people. I don't think either of us has malicious intent in any regard, but I think um, there's been a bit of misassociation or misinterpreting or misquoting, misciting the science. Okay. So I just wanted to clarify that. Okay. Well, first off, by the way, I did mention verified actress and blue check mark, but I should say uh, transgender individual and activist, sure, in case, in case people didn't know, today's topic will be transgenderism. <laughs> and uh, obviously we've gotten into the science quite a bit with our audience. It's not something that we that uh, we hide from them. We certainly don't try to keep people in the dark. But uh, yeah, let, let's let's start with that then. Where, where do you think, I know you've criticized me in a few different areas in this program, and and, and really more so people who, who line up with my worldview as a whole on the current transgender issue. Where do you think it is that, that we've, we've gotten this wrong? Well, I think the first part that I've criticized you a lot is you mentioned, you did a segment on, what was it, like Timmy the Bear, um, where... <laughs> You said something about how uh, trans people post-surgery can't experience sexual pleasure, can't orgasm, and you said it uh, at one point with Ben Shapiro as well, and yeah. that's actually completely incorrect. I can tell you as someone who has had surgery and still experiences sexual pleasure and orgasms that that's not the typical response. I, there's actually studies that show that sure. over 80% remain orgasmic post-surgery, well and Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's that's one that you want. Well, first off, uh, I do want to make sure that we're we're, we're clear on a couple of things. Something that's sure. that's talked about with Timmy the Bear isn't necessarily meant to be a reputable study, but we have discussed. Uh, yeah, for example, I think on the I'm just a what struck me. I don't remember the Timmy the Bear, but I remember in the I'm just a Bill parody. It was many transgenders never experience sexual pleasure again. Now, if I've ever said uh, definitively that no transgenders ever after sexual reassignment therapy can ever have orgasms, yeah, that would be incorrect. But um, no, I, I I appreciate that. Uh, uh, there are studies, though, uh, quite a few that show that, for example, men, 100% of men experience orgasm, uh, cisgender men, to use sort of the nomenclature that's out there nowadays, uh, those who transition, transgenders, it's as low as 65%. So it still is a 35% decrease. And the point that I was making with that is, you know, listen, if you knew there was a 35% chance at that point, if there was 35%, 35 out of 100 chance that you won't ever be able to experience an orgasm again, would that lend to the suicidality, to the morbidity? to the mortality rates that you see in the transgender community. I know for me, if I knew that I was never going to achieve sexual climax again, uh, I'd put a nine millimeter in my mouth. So that was the point that, that, that we were making. No, and the same here too. Um, I'm very vocal about how I'm a huge horror nerd, but the thing that like I can't do in horror, and I think this is where this came out, is uh, the sequence in The Handmaid's Tale that got me the most is the female genital mutilation scene. And I cannot watch that in horror, even though I love horror, love Eli Roth, grew up with horror. But it's, it's this idea that trans people have gone through so much to reclaim their sexuality and their sexual pleasure mm -hmm. that the idea of somebody taking that away, no, believe me, it would make me want to put a nine millimeter in my mouth too if I knew that. So, yes. But I question where you're bringing up that 65%. I'd actually like to see the citations on that sure. um, because I, I, I'd actually like to look at that and kind of what I tell people is, here's some studies, look at the science, yeah. actually read it, make up the decision for yourself. Well, 
the science, you can't really make up the decision, but, you know, go from there. But well, it's people not can cherry, typical. People can cherry pick studies, and that's why meta-analyses yeah. are very important. And, of course, the parameters of scientific studies, that's why double-blind placebo-controlled clinical trials mm -hmm. are considered the gold standard as opposed to just a general study that says, hey, our supplemental formula works. Go take yeah. it, you know, um, yeah. and who's funding the studies. But, yeah, no, science is science, but, of course, there's a way to, to manipulate uh, how it's presented through an agenda. Yeah, here's what we will do, because I obviously it wouldn't be fair for me to bring up studies and do them as an overlay as you're doing this and you don't have the ability, but we will, when we mm -hmm. upload this video, uh, everything that I'm referencing will uh, be available, put them in links, they're available on PubMed. So yeah, oh. it's, it's about 65% um, I'll go in post-op transgenders. Too. Okay. Um, right. I'd, I'd actually like to see that because the one that I, I looked at here, actually, it, it pretty much, it, it does say uh, a large number of transsexuals, 80% reported improvement of their sexuality. Now here's the thing. Um, Majority of participants reported a change in orgasmic feeling, so it differs. And because of brain differences, actually, uh, the orgasm, I, this is just my feeling and kind of on my experience, the mm. orgasm that you have after surgery feels more right and is more, um, let's say, it, 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 it's more pleasurable and more, um, it, it it affects you differently. Yeah. Like, I remember having an orgasm like pre-surgery and that. And you could imagine I'm slightly uncomfortable wrong. with this territory now. Uh, but we can continue. Obviously, listen, this is, this, is edit, this is edit. Well, no, this is <laughs> anecdotal. You're talking about how you feel during orgasms, which I appreciate, mm -hmm. and I hope it's fantastic. I wish you nothing but the best. But I don't necessarily know that that helps the people watching right now. Um, so, yeah, we'll, we'll get this information up there for people who want to watch it. And I know, I know there are several other areas where you've, where you've criticized me um, and the program. Is, is there anywhere else where you think we get the science glaringly wrong? Absolutely. You've also said that suicidality is the same pre and post surgery that's actually yes. been found to be false in multiple different studies that actually use the same methodology pre and post. Mm -hmm. um, I'm quoting, there's one study here from Belgium that in actually... Belgium, yeah. Be I think you quote one study from Belgium and one study from Canada quite a bit, if I'm not mistaken, but uh, uh, yeah, let's go ahead. Yes. There is one from Belgium from 2006 that actually shows that it drops from 29.3% to 5.1%. The study from Canada actually shows 27.1% to 1%. Mm -hmm. But the study that actually you bring up a lot is Dr. Dehegeny's study, uh, the one from Sweden, which mm -hmm. actually doesn't quite say what you think it does. Um, and this, let me actually use Dr. Dehegeny's um, words herself. She actually says that the study as a whole that she did covers a period between 1973 and 2003. Mm -hmm. What she found is that when she divided the cohorts into two groups, 1973 to 19... Oh. Hold on, your mic just muted on us. One second. I don't, I don't want people to think that we're doing evil internet overlord censorship of you. We can't hear you. We lost sound. Oh. Oh, now you're back. You're back. Sorry. Oh, Go ahead. Okay. Take it from Sorry. the top. No. <laughs> and and let, no. let the so. everyone know nothing up my sleeves. It was just an internet issue. Okay. Go ahead. No. Yeah. Um, so Dr. Hegeny found that if she divided the, the cohorts into 1973 to 1988 and 1989 to 2003, Obviously, uh, methodology change, um, diagnostic tools change, mm -hmm. uh, procedures change, but she found that if she divided it, the differences in mortality, suicide attempts, and crime actually disappear and found no different criminality or suicidality than the cisgender controls for the 1989 to, to 2003 so, group. Uh, there are a couple of things. It's not just the Swedish study, though that's an important one, and it's, it's not exactly how you're presenting it. But I would like to, before we do that, because I appreciate you talk about one Belgian study, one Canadian study. This is important for people to know. Um, why do you think that I would completely throw out the study you're mentioning from Belgium? I honestly don't know. I mean, I think some people have an agenda. I don't think you... Uh, here's the thing. Okay, okay, why do you think I would I'm throw out actually, the one from Canada? No. <laughs> um, I, I, I honestly don't know. I, go ahead, tell okay. me. Yeah, well, the, thing <laughs> from, the study from Belgium, and this is one thing that I think is very important because trans, the transgender community likes to say you're denying the science quite a bit, and what they do is take exceptions to the rule rather than the rule. So there's one Belgian study, which was done a while ago. We've done far more studies with greater sample sizes and better, more objective parameters since then. It's interesting to me, too, you just mentioned a 30-point difference between your own studies, the Belgian mm -hmm. study and the Canadian study. Couple of reasons for that. The Belgian study actually, I think it was 100 something people, maybe 107 people who participated. 43% of the participants dropped out, meaning we have no idea what happened to them by the end. 
We have no idea if they're still alive. So 43% of people who started the study were not included at the end of the study. Only 62, I think out of 105 or 107, I don't have it in front of me right now. That distorts the number quite a bit. Of course, um, the Canadian you study, for those who don't know, the Canadian study, based on that only though. study, only, well, I, I will, let me, let me kind of give you my macro, and then if you disagree okay. with it, you can. So that's one study, and that's where you saw it go down from 29% to, I think, 5% is what you quoted. And then you cite a Canadian study where it goes down to 1%. Well, that's statistically significant because the variability there, if it were in one study, it would have to be thrown out and you'd have to redraw this study up because 30% and 1% is pretty big. The Canadian study studies one year. It asks people within the last year of their surgery if they've attempted suicide. So a study where 43% of the people have dropped out, and then a study that only asks people about one year is not the same as the Swedish study that you mentioned, or another Canadian study that's more recent, that actually takes a larger sample size, 300-something people, uh, over the course of many, uh, several decades, and studies objective parameters, like mortality, like morbidity, like suicidality, mm -hmm. but mainly mortality. Are they alive? Are they dead? That's objective, unlike the Belgian study study, which is a questionnaire and 43% dropped out. When you look at those studies that objectively frame in the parameters and aren't, by the way, conducted by a pro-trans activist group as a Canadian study, which you and I both know, come on, it'd be like a supplement company funding a supplement research paper. <laughs> it's 19 to 18 times more likely for post-operative transgenders to commit suicide across the board. In all the other studies across the board, it's between 16 and 19 times more likely than general populace to kill themselves. Well, let me also make a differentiation between those Canadian and the Belgium studies. The Belgium study actually only studied people who had surgery. The Canadian study studied people who, who had stated that they were done transitioning. And for some right. people, that's not surgery. So that's also another factor. I get, again, we're looking at different methodologies, which we can't say are equivalent in any sort of way. But we also have a 2010 meta-analysis. But, but we can say one is more valid. Studies. Right, we do have to agree which one's more valid. One that's funded by the Trans Pulse Project that only asks people in a questionnaire within the last year, or one that studies over 300 people and whether they died or not. One's right. I don't think well, I don't think we can see that in the in a vacuum, and we can't really make distinctions. Let me give you an example. We okay. can't make distinctions based on mortality unless we're comparing the same things pre and post. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry, your sound keeps going out. Again, it's not, it's, not it's, it's the evil overlords at YouTube. They think this is, there you go. Okay, sorry, continue. No, it's, I, yeah. Anyway, so here's kind of a comparative thing. If we did a study of people with cancer and gave them chemotherapy and measured the mortality of people with cancer after getting chemotherapy and measured that against a cisgender, not cisgender, a control of people who didn't have cancer, sure. you would find that the mortality rate would be higher in the people who received chemotherapy and had cancer. But you can't use that then to make a distinction that chemotherapy doesn't improve the chances of, of less mortality sure in people with cancer. Sure you can. Yeah, Not you, if you're comparing it to people who well, don't have cancer. Well, for, oh, first off, let me just establish kind of the, the, the premises here, uh, which we're discussing. I think we both agree the suicide rate is high among the transgender community, the attempted oh, yeah. suicide rate. And if I'm not mistaken, a big criticism that you've had toward me is that post-operative transgenders are actually far less likely. So what we're talking about here, what we are debating, is the idea that post-operative transgenders have improved suicidality rates. So that's why I was discussing these studies. Um, I, I, I don't think there needs to be any correction because, again, let's say you took that study, use your own example, cancer. If you compared mm -hmm. these patients who didn't undergo chemo against the general population said, these people are 19 times more likely to die if they do not receive chemotherapy. And then you gave them chemotherapy and afterwards you said, these people are 19 times more likely to die than the general population, even if they've had chemotherapy, it would be a valid comparison. So I'm addressing your point that you've criticized this show that you say it improves the suicide rates. Uh, it doesn't. It doesn't. And the, the overwhelming number of studies that are performed objectively using objective parameters show that it doesn't unless you cherry pick studies uh, for, uh, funded by transgender activists. And I just don't think that that's a fair way to, to compare science and certainly to come on someone's program or tell someone else that you're going to inform them as to the science. Again, all of these are in PubMed people. Please go research yeah. both, both uh, mm -hmm. your studies and my studies. Yeah, that's what we're talking about. Well, I mean, I can also quote you a 2010 meta-analysis of 28 different studies that showed that 78% of trans people showed an improvement of psychiatric symptoms. Another study of 50 trans women who received genital surgery that found that their physical and mental health was not significantly different from samples of cis women. I mean, we have That's the, a poll. The idea That's that a question. 
there's a, I need to be I need okay. to be really clear here. It's like people. This is a big thing I have with uh, sort of socialists on healthcare. This is why Cubans think they have better healthcare than Americans. If you ask someone, do you think your healthcare is better than the United States, and they say yes, it doesn't mean it's better, right? Our mortality rates are better. Our wait times are are, are lower. Your greatest uh, chance of survival with a terminal illness is living in the United States. But people in Cuba, people in Canada, think they have better healthcare. You are citing studies that revolve around polls and questionnaires. And again, the dropout rate is also very high. That is not as reliable or objective as mortality rates, as medically observable data. And so I think it's important if you are going to take on the responsibility of informing people as to the science to differentiate between polls and questionnaires, how people feel and what happens as far as whether they have a pulse or not. Well, on that sense, I would ask you to find a study that objectively actually states that the pseudocidality actually remains the same pre and post comparing pre to post or goes up post. Mm -hmm. I don't think you can find any study that does that. If you can, please tell me, because I'd love to know. There are a couple studies that I've asked um, several other conservatives who write on transgender issues to at least, you know, if you know of any, please provide them. I'd be willing to read them. But there's no study that shows suicidality goes up when comparing pre to post there. It's never I been never concluded. said goes up. Well, or stays the same. It's, it's, it doesn't get much better is a the point. There can be some studies that show slight improvement. But generally speaking, it's still much higher than the general population. It's not even close. I I, I think there you're making a qualitative analysis, a qualitative uh, distinction there because it does get better regardless. I mean, there's some that show less than others. I, I mean, that's you're playing with numbers there. No, not really. I think if you if you say they have a 41 percent su attempted suicide rate, if you have a study like the Swedish study that you mentioned where it goes up about mm -hmm. it's still 19 times higher than the general population, regardless of the information that you discussed after a 25 year follow up. There's also a more the recent comprehensive cohort. Canadian study uh, that came from uh, Toronto, I believe, where it was about 18 times more likely to commit suicide than the general population. These are post operative transgenders. So, again, this matters because across it's consistent where, OK, here you've got 19 times here, you've got 18, 18 times when you look at the mortality rates, the studies are, are, are pretty conclusive. Now, it doesn't mean that all of them are, are going to show the exact same number, but 18, 19 times, that's more consistent than the studies you mentioned, one of which is funded by a transgender activist group that had a 30% down to 5%, and then you said a new Canadian study says it's down to 1%. I mean, I, most people would look at that, and it doesn't, it doesn't pass the sniff test. Again, I think you're looking at it in a vacuum because there are also studies that have measured not just transition, but other factors because the, the high suicide rate, as other trans activists will tell you, mm -hmm. doesn't just come from gender dysphoria. It also comes from the way they're treated and we're treated in the population. And we actually have, I'm looking at one study right here, transphobic violence showed strong associations with suicidality. It showed that 56% had considered suicide in the past year and 29% attempted contrasting 28 had considered and four had attempted who hadn't experienced mm -hmm. transphobic harassment, threats, or violence. So, I mean, you're looking at it in a vacuum and we can't really look at things in a vacuum. We can just look at all this data mm -hmm. and kind of make conclusions. We're, we're kind of going closing and closing and closing the gap with all the data we're seeing, but the closing of the gap is going in the direction that it helps, not that it doesn't. So, I mean, if you want that to be your position that there's not enough data, I mean, that's completely fine. And no, that, no, 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 my position, my, and I want to make it really clear. First off, I think I want to re re reiterate, I think that you want to improve the quality of life for transgenders. And I think you want society to be as functional and tolerant as possible. I believe that's your objective. And that's certainly my objective. Um, so, uh, no, my position isn't there's not enough data. I want to be very clear because I know a lot of times people will have people from opposing viewpoints and sort of feign middle ground. No, my position is that there is such overwhelming data right now uh, that it's not good. Now, it, it, what you just said there, I do agree with, of course. People who are bullied, people who are mistreated, people who are abused probably have increased rates of suicidality. I think we would both agree with that. But the truth is that minority groups in general actually have lower suicide rates. For example, blacks compared to whites. I don't think anyone here would say that black people are less likely to be victims of hate crimes. Nowhere else do you find the attempted suicide rate in society outside of modern transgenderism and wanting what's best for them, wanting uh, a, a higher quality of life. I don't think that pumping people with hormones or going through sex reassignment, it's, it's, it's clearly not the solution. That's my, my stance. Here's where I want to correct you on looking at other minorities and why that okay. doesn't make sense. 
the LGBT community is the only minority where a lot of that transphobic abuse is actually coming from inside their very own family. It's not just society. I mean, blacks aren't giving other black people within their family um, racism. It's it, if it is, it's extremely rare. But the the amount of abuse and violence that you even see against LGBT people within their own family is much much higher. And so you have to see that in context as well. Um, okay, a cu couple of things there. Uh, I disagree. I think you see all kinds of abuse, for example, in black American families, let alone fatherlessness. Uh, and, and then it would be true across the board with you just kind of lump it all in. And we've had a lot of gay activists on this program who don't like the LGBTQ AAIP now. And I'm sure you don't like some of the parts that are being added to the acronym as, as the T. They don't like the T just sort of piggybacking on the LGB. Um, they don't have the same suicide rates gays and lesbians. It's not even mm -hmm. close. It's exclusive to the transgender community. And if you look at paranoid schizophrenics, that's where you would have a, a similar suicide rate. You don't see it in any other minority group, including, by the way, minority groups throughout history who were woefully abused. So um, I, I just, I don't, I, I don't think that holds water. I want to decrease the suicide rate, but I don't think it's because they're being ostracized by society. Well, I mean, also when you're looking at the time frame of uh, 1973 to 1988 versus 1989 to 2011, you also have to admit that things have gotten a lot better civil rights wise for the LGBT community. So, again, you can't look at it in a vacuum and just say We're American just slaves at didn't have the same suicide rate. They didn't have the same kind of uh, abuse from within their family. Very rarely from within their family their own family, they didn't. They often didn't know who their family was. They'd get the bullwhip every now and then from Whitey in a cotton field of Missouri and uh, be fortunate that it wasn't worse either than that. Thing. Let's just, just. I know, just, yes, just understand. to be clear, Jewel Ray Goldstein I'm is not, not pro-slavery. I'm not endorsing either. I'm just saying that you, it's not a fair uh, a comparison. That's all I'm saying, okay? Don't, I think it's a know. very unfair comparison to uh, American slaves. Yeah, I think they had it much worse than transgenders in 2018. Uh, well, I... I I actually would agree. Okay. I, I, I definitely agree on that. Uh, I think things are getting better. I mean, we have more health care. So we do have it better than slaves back then. I, why did we get into this? <laughs> well, I was just saying because you were talking about suicide rates. And, and, and again, I'm using an extreme example to make a point. And it's, the point is, is, is still made. Nowhere else do you see this kind of a suicide rate. And I think that matters. When you say things like, and I know you're, well, well actually this would be a, a perfect transition to the next topic where I, I know I think you've, mm -hmm. you've criticized my position. When you say let's give kids puberty blockers or hormone replacement therapy, when you say the solution is gender reassignment surgery, and you're looking at a suicide rate that does doesn't really get better, even in the face of these wildly invasive procedures and inter interventions. At some point, we have to say, okay, maybe this isn't the solution. And because I want a higher quality of life for transgender people across the board, that's why I line up the way I do. That's why I think that gender dysphoria should be treated a different way uh, outside of hormones, injections, or um, plastic surgery. So that brings up one point just before we move on to the next thing, which yes. if you have, again, I've asked several other conservatives, including um, Ryan Anderson, who just wrote a book on transgender issues, and he can't answer this either. If you want trans people to, or people with gender dysphoria to be treated with a different medical uh, treatment, sure. you have to provide evidence that that medical treatment actually consistently and effectively alleviates gender dysphoria, and mm -hmm. you don't have that. There is no study that shows alternative treatments have been shown to consistently and effectively treat gender dysphoria and alleviate it, and we've had reparative therapy and um you know uh reparative but neither therapy, do you though that, therapy. That, that's a big point Ni neither do you what you're presenting here doesn't help and there certainly yeah. are some issues actually that i would present when we're talking about children there are issues that completely uh, alleviate it actually um as far as adult trans transgenders you know i don't know that i necessarily have the solution uh but but neither do you so i think at that point err on the side of caution and not pumping, you know, a guy full of estrogen, which we know has these negative ramifications, incredibly negative side effects. And with children, yeah, there are ways to completely alleviate it with children and teens. Um, so I would like to transition to, to that. Okay. Maybe we can go back to that if you'd like. Um, no, yeah, go, go right ahead. It's your show. <laughs> no, but I, I appreciate it. What's your position on, on transitioning uh, children? I, if, for people who don't know, I, I, I'm against it. I think it's child abuse. Sure. I think we have to uh, really stick by the DSM-5 and WPATH SOC standards. I don't think it's as simple as every kid who says that they're transgender immediately, puberty blockers, hormones. I think everybody, 
kids have to be assessed based on the highest quality standards. Okay. And the problem is that uh, I know you're about to bring up these system studies, uh, but they were uh, all done. And there's actually reviews that have been done specifically on the literature. And Dr. Steensma, who is the most quoted uh, study on desistance has come out and said those those uh, figures that he cites are misleading because they now, can you provide the different. figures because actually I, I don't have those studies in front of me um, um, which one dr. Uh, Steensma I, I think that was the one that you said I was going to use I, I don't have any I don't believe I have any plans to Oh, um, I don't have that one specifically okay. I have quotes from dr. Steensma, but usually people cite it as 80% desistance Okay um, but Steensma has, number one, he's actually said um, that providing these assistance numbers only leads to the wrong. Can I ask you a question before we go? What's your mm -hmm. position? on? So you yeah. said higher standards. Okay. So how mm -hmm. should we standardize for children uh, to be given hormone replacement therapy or puberty blockers? Um, what is a standard to be set and, and what age do you think it is? I want to make sure we're not arguing over something that maybe we don't disagree on. Uh, so what, is, what would be your stance there? Oh, absolutely. Well, first of all, no puberty blockers before Tanner Stage 2. That's based on the uh, WPATH SOC and the DSM-5. Mm -hmm. Tanner Stage 2, puberty has actually already started. Mm -hmm. um, no psychiatrist or endocrinologist, even trans um, positive or affirming ones, will provide or should provide puberty blockers before st Tanner Stage 2. Okay. That usually happens between ages 9 to 11. So it's not like we're putting three or four year olds. I completely disagree that that would happen. Usually you wait a couple years, make sure that that is right. The puberty blockers are right. Yeah, um, HRT typically comes around 13, 14 if they started puberty blockers early, if they started puberty blockers later, you know, give them time to figure it out. Um, the point about affirming therapy. So, so I want to make clear mention, between nine and 11 um, is the age you're talking about to start puberty blockers. Correct. But I'm not, again, I'm not just saying anybody who goes in and says they're Sure. No, I, I understand. I just want to make sure because I, I disagree regardless. I want to make sure my position mm -hmm. is clear. And, you're, and then, uh, yeah, but, con but continue. I just want to make sure we understood that premise there because it is, it is a sliding scale, right? Some people do mm -hmm. go a lot younger and some people go older. Some people go as far as 16. And it, 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 sometimes it seems arbitrary to me. I just wanted to make sure I had your position clear. No, I mean, I don't think it's necessarily arbitrary. I think it's individualized to people. I mean, people don't go puberty, go through puberty at the same time, and they shouldn't be given puberty blockers at the same time either. I mean, I... I, again, I didn't start I shaving until I was 20. My wife jokes that she put hair in my chest. I didn't grow chest hair until my 20s. So, yeah, I was a late bloomer and an angry late bloomer. Hence what you see before you. But, uh, yeah, sorry, continue. Oh, so the point is, I do support affirming therapy, but the thing about affirming therapy is that a lot of people have, uh, at least on your side, I'll say conservative side, I don't want to assume your side. I am conservative, that's um, fine, I appreciate it though. Okay. Um, uh, that affirming therapy is taking kids down a path of transition, and that's not the point of affirming therapy. Actually, the entire point of the affirming approach is to give kids and youth the space to explore their identity and expression. And sometimes that leads to transition, sometimes it doesn't. I mean, we have uh, cases of kids who went on puberty blockers, found that it wasn't the right thing, came off, went through puberty as normal, perfectly fine, mm -hmm. realized it wasn't for them. So that's, that's not what you're doing with affirming therapy, and that's what I, I, don't, I don't think anybody should be pushed one way or another. I don't think kids should be told you're transgender versus I don't think kids should be told you're not transgender. I think we should listen, monitor, yes, let them lead, but do so based on uh, rigorous scientific standards. I think it's a horrible idea. I think letting children okay. lead is a bad idea all around. I, I don't think we don't let children lead in deciding what they have for lunch. If it were me and I, I, I were in charge of any of my own decision making abilities, my breakfast would be nothing but toaster strudels and boogers I'd wiped on the couch the night previously. Uh, so the study that I was talking about beforehand, I think, or, or that I was what I, I was thinking about. You mentioned someone else, Cheatma or something. Um, no, I think of, of the thinking thing of the the, the Drescher. Uh, I think Drescher and Paula. Drescher. It's somewhere around 2013, 2014. Uh, yeah, 75 to yeah. 90 percent of children with gender dysphoria just completely grow out of it. 
completely grow out of it. So 75 to 90%. So I'm actually using something that's a little lower. I think you mentioned something around 85%. Um, so I think that's why the standards are so important, especially when we're talking about putting children on mm -hmm. puberty blockers. And, and especially like you talked about, you know, endocrinologists, the, the connection between neurology and hormones is unbelievably powerful. And we're talking a, at a rapid stage where the brain is developing and it directly correlates to hormonal transitioning. Uh, so 75% to 90% of children with gender dysphoria or nine to 11 11 year olds um, mm -hmm. will grow out will grow out of it completely and yeah. of course avoid that cr that super high suicide rate avoid all of the you know systemic uh, oppression discrimination that you've talked about even though I would t totally disagree with people who mistreat transgenders but the point is it's about 75 to 90 percent that number goes down to zero uh, if you actually put them on puberty blockers well okay so there are several different things you're bringing in here so let me just go one by one really quick the first thing is that all those studies were looking at dsm-4 diagnostics which is actually gender identity disorder which conflated gender non-conforming behavior with gender dysphoria the dsm-5 actually separates them diagnostically as two completely different things a kid who is gender non-conforming or has gender non-conforming behavior under the dsm-5 would not qualify for medical transition in any sort of form, unless they're above age of medical consent, but then we get into questions of informed consent. Which we also get into questions of politicization topic. of science that yeah. we've talked about, because in China, mm -hmm. it's still considered a mental disorder to be gay. And there is a lot of politics at play right now with the DSM-5. And also, I noticed that the transgender community brings out things they like about the DSM-5 and some things that they don't like about the DSM-5. But the data well, that we have objectively available to us shows that the vast majority of children who uh, suffer from gender dysphoria or who identify as someone of the opposite gender grow out of it. Well, let me get back to your 0% because I think that's very, very important because mm -hmm. the kids, for the most part right now, who are being given puberty blockers have been diagnosed with gender dysphoria based on the DSM-5 specifically, which means that they are not likely to desist. So you're making a distinction that going on puberty blockers is what's causing, um, not desistance, God, why do I, de um, uh, consistence, de not desistance. Um, I understand the word you're talking about. Continue. Basically yeah. saying, do over. I don't, I was wrong. That's what we're talking about. It's okay with the nomenclature. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, no, I'm not. I am talking about people who identify as a member of the opposite gender, uh, versus people who get put on puberty blockers. So let's say that I have a 75 to 90% number. Again, the study will go up at PubMed. Let's say the number is 50%. The point is you talked about standards, right? Saying not anyone who just claims to be, uh, who claims to be transgender should be allowed to undergo this treatment. But the fact is these are the same people, the fifth, let's say 50%, but it's 75 to 90 who go back and say, well, you know what, I was wrong about that, completely grow out of it. These are the same people where it's a 0% rate if they undergo puberty blockers, which again would suggest it's too early in the developmental stages for these kids to make a decision. And, and at 9 to 11, which is what you cited, I would absolutely say that uh, someone that age is in no position to lead and they should be given no authority whatsoever regarding permanent sexual decisions or even temporary puberty blockers as it's being sold now. Well, again, you're going by DSM-4 standards, which the vast majority, even the person who uh, put the DSM-4 standards in place, Dr. Zucker in Canada, um, pretty much stated that the reason he changed the DSM-3 standards, which actually fell more towards gender dysphoria, into the DSM-4 standards, uh, which uh, conflated gender nonconforming behavior with gender dysphoria, is so he could pathologize. Um, gender non-conforming kids, and I completely disagree, and trans activists completely disagree with gender non-conforming kids who, are n who don't have gender dysphoria getting treatment. But the problem is those 75%- How do you measure it then? Highly, Let's, highly- Because you're, you're, getting, you're getting off on this. You, you, you're getting, this is, we're getting really mm -hmm. nitpicky. I, I want to make it clear. I don't think you're going to convince anyone here when you use the number nine to 11. I don't agree in any capacity period, okay. that they should be allowed to undergo any kind of hormonal transitions or puberty blockers. But you're saying, okay, how do we differentiate then? What are the standards? Mm -hmm. Kid comes in and uh, says, I'm transgender. How do you say they're not? You, uh, I'm, not a I'm not a psychiatrist, I'm not a psychologist, but we have very clear DSM-5 standards that require a, a, a minimum of six months of observation before even being able to get to that diagnostic standard. So we can put up the DSM-5 standards and I'd be glad to send that over to so yes. that your audience can see that too, so that they can make the decision for themselves and they can see the standards. I think they can see the standards. And I, I, that's another thing mm -hmm. that's very, I think very, very important because you can go to five different psychiatrists and get five different diagnoses, no matter what it is, whether it's 
it's bipolar disorder, whether it's ADHD, whether it's depression. I mean, uh, antidepressants have less than a, than a 50% success rate, a lot of them. So it's not necessarily a science that's been completely honed in. So even if I go along with you on that trail, it's certainly not a roll of the dice I'd be willing to make with nine to 11 year olds putting them on puberty blockers. Um, but if there is anything else, I guess, on that topic that you'd, you'd like to explore, because I don't want to go back and forth on just DSM-4, DSM-5, because like I said, mm -hmm. I want to be clear, I'm not okay with it any of it. Any 9 to 11 year old, anyone under the age of 18, if they cannot actually rent a car because their brain isn't fully developed, if their insurance is through the roof because their brain isn't fully developed, I don't support altering their hormones. Well, I mean, again, I'm, I'm not going to go back to it, but something to consider is that if you don't want us to treat gender, uh, gender dysphoric youth with, uh, the, with the standards that there are medical studies that show that it works, how do you want to treat them? And are you just going to not treat them and let them suffer from depression and suicidality? I mean, that's, that's kind of the, the, where you're going at if you're not yes. going to treat them. But, okay. So as, far, as, far as, puberty, as far as puberty blockers, yes, I would not treat them. I would absolutely treat them with therapy. Uh, of course, uh, uh, try to teach them to live with, uh, but you know, we always talk about kids accepting themselves for who they are. I know we're going to get into a great territory. Well, who they are is really secretly a woman trapped in a man's body or a girl trapped in a boy's body. I would certainly uh, use therapy and try to get them to come to grips with the biological reality that they're a boy or a girl. Then I would administering puberty blockers to nine or 11 year olds. Yes. I hope I've answered it clearly. Okay. And, and again, kind of where I was coming with that is for your side, if, if you want to convince people on my side is actually go through studies of treating kids with that method and let's see if it works if it's medically found to be working maybe you have a point i think so it's child I'll, abuse I'll i wouldn't i wouldn't be willing, just like i wouldn't be willing to you know test ra test radioactive material on children that could harm them and say well we'll have a study listen it's the same reason it's really hard to get can uh, pharmaceutical drugs for cancer right to get approved a lot of people think it's big pharma there's a com there's a certain component of that but people who are on death uh, death uh, death row effectively with cancer people on their deathbed death row i'm using this symbolically people are like, you doesn't know the difference between death row yeah you know what i'm not talking about people on the green mile but people on their deathbed with cancer aren't necessarily willing to risk taking a placebo pill. Uh, I'm not willing to risk experimental treatment with children and hormone blockers, period. Me either, and, and that's where we agree, but we're coming at it from different places. We, we both agree that we don't want to experiment on children, but we both see it from a different side. So. Okay. Okay. Um, now, the one thing I wanted to get back to you on brains is we actually do have plenty of studies that have studied pre-treatment uh, pre trans people comparing them to cisgender people and found that those brain differences occur before treatment. It's not something that just occurs with HRT or with surgery. It's something that is ingrained. And there are studies that are showing it. There, there was a study released th earlier this year that, again, I'll cite in the, in the video, that uh, showed it in kids under 10, mm. that those uh, differences in the brain where they looked at trans girls and found that the brains were more similar to those of cisgender girls and trans boys, cis boys, equally. So it's not just something that happens with treatment. It's something that is innate in a certain sense. Okay. Um, I, I would disagree, but I do appreciate you presenting this because it seems to me that you would make, be making the argument that transgenderism is not gender, it's biological, it's, it's, it's sex. There's a, there's a male brain and a female brain would seem to be the, the premise of, of your uh, position there. <laughs> So here's, here's the point that I want to make, uh, because I find that a lot of people conflate it, and this is one of the problems I have with the term gender identity, okay. is that when we talk about gender identity, people look at the word gender and say, well, gender is cultural. Why do you have to, why are you saying it has to do anything with biology? The problem is that the term gender identity actually encompasses uh, aspects of biological sex and gender. It's not just gender. So it's a little misleading. Okay. So I, I just wanted to point that out because I know that comes out a lot. That came out on Twitter this morning. I think I was having a, a discussion with somebody that said gender identity is culture. It's like, no, gender identity is a lot more. Discussion complex. is being very generous when applying it to Twitter. There was a, a typing shouting match, but uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's not much productive discussion <laughs> takes place on Twitter. Um, okay, well, I appreciate that because that's certainly not what's taught in college. They've really tried to separate sex and gender. I mean, obviously you've seen when we did the change my mind, people said, well, sex is entirely biological, gender is cultural. And it seems to me that you're saying that's that's not entirely accurate and it's 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 not really a fair way to present the argument as is currently being presented. Well, I, I don't think you can see it as black and white either. I, here's the problem. Gender identity as a term doesn't just encompass. So there is gender and there is sex, but the term gender identity doesn't just mean gender. 
And the problem is by having the term gender identity, you're conflating it with gender. And no, it's actually a combination of gender and sex. So it's a, that's why I say it's misleading. Okay. So, th so then I, I guess before we get into the, the, the nitty gritty of, of studies, um, how would you say that, let's say, a male to female transgender has a female brain? Or a female to male transgender has a male brain uh, pre-sex uh, hormone replacement therapy? Uh, I mean, you can look at the studies. It's pretty much uh, neurons, gray matter, uh, uh, all these different structures. Right. Uh, so here's the thing. I think... Uh, and I agree with you. I agree with you. I'm saying there are mm -hmm. definitively male brains and female brains. They're, they're definitively different, mm -hmm. right? I think we both and agree. I just want to make sure we agree. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. And that's, that's kind of one of the problems that I have with some of the, what they call themselves radical feminists or something, where they say it's like, oh, there's no difference between brains. It's like, bull, bull crap. <laughs> there's differences between male and female brains. And that's that, but to, to, to me, that's why trans people exist, is because there are other differences. I, I always use the, the, the Joker meme. It's like, tell people that genitals are sexually dimorphic and nobody bats an eye, but tell people that brains are sexually dimorphic as well and everybody loses their goddamn minds. Yeah, I, well, I appreciate your consistency there because obviously it, the, the whole argument collapses because you can't say that, there's, that someone uh, identifies as a male or a female of gender is entirely socially constructed, but then also imply that they have the wrong brain trapped in the wrong body because well, hold on a second is it biological or is it gender uh, socially constructed so I do appreciate your consistency there and I think that so if I'm, I wanted to clarify that because I think it's different from a lot of pro uh, sort of transgender activist cohorts who just really muddy the waters and I think it's confusing to a lot of people when they try to make their argument and I think yours is certainly more consistent um, and your position based on that is that there are uh, the, the studies outweigh uh, the sort of um, I guess you would say that the, you think there are more studies than not that show that the, the, the changes in brain, uh, in, in one's brain occur before hormone replacement therapy. Yeah, we have enough because I think um, when you were on with, uh, I talk a lot with Zach Ford, and when you were on with Zach, you mentioned a study that was only looking at post um, to, make a def to make a sort of a conclusion, and you mm -hmm. can't really do that. You have to look pre versus post, because even that study was coming to the conclusion that, well, this difference might have been pre, but we weren't looking at people pre. Right. And so we have to actually take studies again. I think you're talking, about, you're talking about the, the, the looters study, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, we have to use the same methodology and look pre to post to actually come to a definitive conclusion. We can't just yeah. take arbitrary Sure. Segment. Well, and I do think it's important to note that, that, you know, these conversations don't exist in a vacuum. So sometimes people say, well, you know, you took that study and it contradicts your position. Well, no, hold on a second. We were referencing that study at the time because of the topic being discussed with Zach Ford. Those aren't the only studies that we've referenced on this show. Again, we're very transparent about our sources. Um, I do think you're right that you do need to compare pre and post. And the study that I think we've used on this show quite a bit more is, is uh, the, the Savick and Arbor study that uh, actually shows um, that, no, the changes occurred after. Uh, and that they didn't believe in the, uh, uh, the, the dogma that, um, that transgender brains are somehow different before any kind of hormone replacement therapy. So that's, that's one I think, again, it's at, at PubMed, people can find it. I believe it's mm -hmm. Savick and Harbor. Um, there was another one published in 2018 that uh, found, actually, fu funny enough, funny enough, something that bo might have surprised both of us, that some variations in transgender brains actually uh, were a byproduct of environment and culture, not vice versa. So there are quite a few studies uh, out there that would actually sort of uh, un under undermine your premise. Yeah, and I'm always, you know, look at the data, make up your own mind, but I think um, medical organizations are going to make up their mind based on the studies they have and the conclusions that those studies have drawn. And while all the studies are showing one sort of perspective and one conclusion and all are kind of, regardless of how big or how small they are, they're kind of coming to the same conclusion. Again, I, I, I get that you disagree, um, but while they come to that same conclusion, they're going to set their standards a certain way. And that's yeah. why if you, and this is kind of where I'm going to tell you, if you want to win, if your side wants to change medical standards, what you need to no, do. No, no, we're not, we're not the ones trying to change medical standards. Let me make that really clear here. The transgender community is. We're not changing medical um, standards. I think the medical standards, see, that's where I, I, I kind of go a little back because I think the medical standards are fine as is. I mean, now the AMA, the APA, um, uh, the, uh, 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 gosh, what am I thinking of? Uh, pretty much every major medical organization on the planet is not, is, has pretty much said that all the studies show that transition actually does help.
alleviate gender dysphoria. Oof, oof, oof. I think, I think you were doing better until you got there. You said pretty much all the major medical organizations in the world well, say that all the it. studies completely incorrect. I'm sorry, but if hedge your bets there a little bit, say there are a lot of medical groups that take some studies and they have concluded that, but all major medical organizations say that all the studies, no, I mean, in this, this one alone, I've listed you five or six or seven or eight, all of which have much larger sample sizes, much lower dropout rates and rely on objective data as opposed to questionnaires. So to say all medical organizations, aside from Johns Hopkins, that's a hate group, uh, out there agree on all the studies, all it's just you. not accurate. That's not accurate to say. Well, I'd actually like to see one major medical organization that says that transitioning doesn't help. And if you're going to say the, um, what's the, the pediatricians, the College of Pedi AC Peds, uh, they're at, they are not going by the science. I mean, I, I, well, see, this I, is, and this I'm, is what I'm you're doing with your, you. with your research as well. I would say you cherry pick where you go, well, they're not going by the science. As a sci the science that I've established here, the science that I agree with, they're not going. Johns Hopkins is not going with our science. Therefore, all of the studies agree with me. No, uh, I just presented more than you have presented you know, with bigger sampling sizes and more objective data. Again, mortality rates are more objective than questionnaires. And that's what's important. And when you look at the objective mm -hmm. studies and parameters, first off, I would even say, I would even give you this. There are some that there are conflicting studies. I would even give you that. But you seem so secure in the data that you presented, which largely is based on polling and questionnaires and eliminated any scientific data that disagrees with your position. I don't think you're going to convince anyone. And I, I, I think that's a real problem. It's not my job, listen, to win people over to the idea that if you're born uh, chromosomally a man and with a penis that... Um, you know, undergoing a sex reassignment surgery doesn't make you a woman. It's not my job to prove that. It's never been my job to prove that. And I think if you're going to prove it definitively and tell people they need to know, they're not educated on the science, you have to do better than cherry picking some studies. There's only one person here who's presented studies that were funded by trans activist groups or uh, any kind of a group that would have a political bias, and it's been yourself. There's only been one person here who's presented studies that rely on questionnaires or subjective data or polling, and that's been yourself. And I think that's important. So then to make the statement that all major medical organizations agree on all the studies, that is the issue. That's not intellectually honest. I think we could both agree on that. That statement. Oh, okay. I'll 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 admit that saying all is probably a little facetious. Okay. I'll say the majority. Okay. Right. Um, now here's the thing with Johns Hopkins. I, I want to just point out really quick the study that Paul McHugh did that in the 70s that determined that transitioning doesn't help. He was actually using his own biases. So let me just give you an example, and I'll tell you, like, for myself, I am a transgender woman who went through surgery and everything, but I still have relationships with women. I am a lesbian. I like women. According to Paul McHugh, I would have a negative, non-lesser uh, quality of life uh, standard based on the study that he used to uh, end transition treatment at Johns Hopkins. So I, I definitely want to say, people, look at the study that Paul McHugh is using, right. used in the 70s, to stop the transition treatment. It's a little more complex than he found that it didn't help. He was using his own biases to determine that it didn't yes, help. Yes, and, and by the way, I want to be clear. I was, I was referring to them because a lot of people I know have referred to them as a hate group. I, I didn't reference any of their studies here today, um, but I would agree that there's some bias there from him. Uh, much like the Trans Pulse Project, which was the first study that you cited here uh, with a Canadian study that only studied people one year after transitioning and whether they felt like they wanted to commit suicide or not. All right, listen, Julie Ray Goldstein, I really do appreciate you taking the time. Where is the best place for people to find you and everyone out there be polite comment below show your support for us having a discussion because you know what I love about this you and I agreed on virtually nothing it doesn't have to be common ground or assholery you can completely disagree and be civil and so I, I I hope that you feel the same way I really appreciated this conversation no that I again like I'm uh, I'm not finding this I think neither of us are finding this a lot lately in the current environment we're just not all we hear is like all these noise and we're not having conversations I think we need to be doing this more often just my personal opinion I completely agree with um, you and so it's uh... they can oh they can find me at Julie Ray J U L I E R E I Ray R E I like the store not the pop star uh, on Twitter, um, all over the place. Uh, I'm, I'm an actress, as you mentioned. I'm the only, uh, pr not only, probably only or one or two 
trans actresses in Hollywood currently working who has never been on a reality show or worked as a transgender character on a show. Okay. Even though I've been on like Comedy Central and um, worked with Alana Glazer, Zach Galifianakis, a bunch of really good people. Um, you can look at my IMDb for all of that stuff. But look at my Twitter. I make announcements there. I also stream on Twitch if you like video games. Uh, which I'm sure most of your audience does. I don't. See, that would be an example where I have more of a female brain. Uh, but let me, let me ask you this. I think you and I might find some common ground there because if I'm not mistaken, you know, right now they're mad at lesbian, uh, was it lesbian Batwoman or lesbian Superwoman for not being woke enough. Mm. And a lot of people get mad when there are actors who aren't trans playing trans characters. If I'm not mistaken, you're not necessarily entirely on board with that, right? Well, here's the thing. I've I've actually been outspoken for years about what I what what is called virtue signaling, and I actually wrote a piece for Time criticizing Mount Holyoke when they took out the vagina monologues for saying that it wasn't trans inclusive. I actually wrote a piece for Time because I'm like I've done the vagina monologues for over a decade. It's one of the most trans inclusive pieces there is, and even within the horror community, um, we have like uh, there are haunts every uh, October, and um, the, the haunt community. There are a lot of people within the haunt community who are affected by mental health issues. It's a completely different topic, but it seems like people are trying to talk for other groups, and I hate that. Yeah. Uh, just let people talk for themselves. Uh, no virtue signaling. That's my personal Well, I, I, I appreciate that. Do you, do you get aggravated if you see a non-transgender play, for example, like Jeffrey, T Tran uh, blah, 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 Jeffrey Tambor in Transparent? There's a t tongue twister to say. Uh, let, let's disregard you know, that, he was, that he was groping the craft services lady at the table behind the camera, but um, it, it, where, where do you line up on that? Because, again, I appreciate uh, your consistency there. Mm -hmm. So where I come about it is that I don't think that trans characters should be played by cis actors. I think trans characters should be played by trans actors and cis actors should only play cis characters. But the problem that I come with and from what I see here is that the vast majority of the roles and characters that we see in media don't have a specific gender identity. They could very well be trans or they could very well be cis. And when you have a position like that, and what I advocate for is for casting directors to bring in more trans actors for all those other types of roles. Hmm. For example, I've played an android, I've played a cave woman, uh, I played Lauren Cohan's sister on Tim and Eric. Okay. And, you know, you could say that they were trans or you could say that they were cis because gender identity didn't matter for any of the roles that I was doing. And I I'm very for uh, more trans actors getting into those kind of roles and being brought in for those kind of roles. But when it is a specific trans character or a cis character, I yeah. think that should be specific regardless of which way you're going. Well, and I appreciate that because it's consistent because obviously Hollywood has had it both ways where they've had um, they've had cis characters played by transgender actors sometimes. And then when you go the other way, they're going, well, hold on, it has to be a transgender yeah. actor. Uh, I, I, I would, I would, you know what? I would go with you on that. If, it was, if, if those were the rules, okay. I just think everyone's a little bit murky on the rule book and now even they're re trying to retroactively rewrite the rules on who can play gay characters. In that case, Ang Lee would have never won an Oscar. All right, at Julie Ray, J-U-L-I-E, Ray, R-E-I. Uh, Julie Ray Goldstein, thank you for taking the time today. We really do appreciate it, and I hope you, uh, hope you stay, stay happy, safe, healthy. <laughs> Thanks, Stephen. You too. Take it easy. Hey, if you like this video, subscribe or click the notification bell right next to the subscription button because subscribing doesn't mean anything anymore now according to the YouTube gods. And uh, if you like the late night show, you can watch it every single day, a full hour at loudwithcredit.com slash mug club. Subscribe there. That way we aren't beholden to the evil YouTube overlords and we don't have to start playing video games with mouth sound effects or children react.